My guest today is Hannes Pasqualini, and you probably know his work from this company, or maybe this company, or this company. I hope I'm marking it right. Hannes is an interface designer, but he's also doing illustrations and visual identities and brand identities. And what I find really interesting is how his designs are informed by all these different practices that can be quite different from one another. When you're doing illustration, it can be super free and relaxed and, and yeah, abstract, I guess. But interface design is the opposite of this, it's supposed to be communicative and clear and pretty much straight to the point. Hannes needs to work with engineers and to understand what exactly the instrument's supposed to be doing and how people are going to be interacting with it. His role is huge in the sense that everything that you're interacting with went through his eyes first to make sure that the vision of the engineer goes through. And as you're about to see, it's not just moving a couple of knobs on the screen. It can get quite complicated when you need to take into account a lot of stakeholders that inform how the design should be. This is the Synth Design Podcast. I'm Roy, and this is Hannes Pasqualini from Paper Noise. You know, there's a bit the intersection between, I would say, branding, visual design, <clears throat> sorry, visual design, and then user interface interaction. How do you interact with in instrument? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach the, the process from the beginning? Is it something that um, the, um, the DSP designer approaches you and says, we're going to be working on this, these are the features, and you take it from there or like, what is the process? Yeah, as, as everybody works differently. So some people will maybe come with a ready an idea of an interface. Some people will just have a, an idea of how things work in the circuit or in the software. Um, and usually they approach me, well, some people at the beginning started by sending me like finished layouts for the panel and, and say, yeah, can you make some graphics for that? Mm -hmm. But then over time, these people realize that it's better to like at least keep the dialogue open regarding the interface. And I usually always uh, work now from more from the features, from what the instrument is supposed to do and try to build an interface from that and how I get like the initial brief can change a lot. Sometimes it's really like an email that says, okay, I think this module should, should do this and this. And that's the controls I imagine. That's the inputs and outputs I imagine. And let's try to squeeze it into like, I don't know, 20 HP, 30 HP, 10 HP, depending on the kind of module. Mm. And, and and I take it from there. Or some people maybe make some drawings and say, yeah, I was thinking this, I was thinking that. There, there often is some ideas already because I think most people, when they design the circuit or the software, they already imagine what what's the parameters you know, I interact with. Um, most of the time, there's also some thinking on, on the ranges and on, on how things uh, interact with each other. And so there is usually not like a blank slate. There's already something there. But of course, it needs to be put to test. It needs to be also... The, the big challenge is usually how do you take all of that and make it fit into a predefined space with the kind of controls that you have at your disposal and make it work so that it's usable, it's uh, inspiring, it's interesting, and it's musically interesting you know for for whoever plays with it yeah and it's very different than working with software because of course you're you're you have some predefined uh things that you need to work with especially with modules so um, to make some more specific ex um, examples maybe i think i i think the most interesting makers that i could uh, talk about and maybe show some examples from is hex inverter and usable instruments, mm -hmm. mostly because I've made more modules for them than for anybody else. So there's this kind of a big range. And also it spans across uh, several years. And there's also developments in these years, which could be interesting. 
uh, to talk about. And for example, Emily usually just sends me a rough, yeah, a list of what the module is supposed to do. Sometimes there is like a quick mock-up made in Photoshop that is more there so I understand what the email is saying. And maybe there's some initial ideas about what could be done in which way. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, Hex Inverter, we went from like having a layout already defined by Stacy from Hex Inverter to now, yeah, with Mindfacer, for example, it was more like, okay, that's that's what the module is supposed to do. And we're not even done with that because we're still thinking about certain, certain functions and features. So that was like, I went into that project kind of when the whole circuit development was still underway and yeah. still in development, which is another interesting aspect, you know, when the, the interface is being developed alongside the rest. So there is a dialogue between the two things and one often kind of informs the other. Yeah. Which, which approach do you uh, prefer working on? I think what I prefer to do is less, less I am, uh, less there is things predefined, the better for me usually. I like to just take everything, throw it onto, uh, usually a start, I, I mostly work with Illustrator. I just open up Illustrator. I have all my controls and, and I just, I say, okay, let's see how many knobs. Okay, that's the knobs. Uh, how many jacks? Okay, that's the jacks. How many buttons? And I put them there and I shuffle them around until something starts to emerge, basically. And in that process, also try to figure out which one should be a bigger knob, which one should be a smaller knob, which one, yeah. Yeah. Even though, of course, that there's already some ideas about that usually, what should how, be like a trim or yeah. how, how long is uh, does a process like this uh, take? from from your perspective so let's say that the the um, technical side would actually be complete mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how how long does it make sense to actually invest in designing ah. just the interface <laughs> well you know the thing is often you think the the, the circuit is complete and then it, while you work on the interface you realize it's not complete there's still some things to need. but yeah that's maybe another topic but generally you know the um, I would say most of the projects take months from when the circuit is kind of, yeah, okay, there's a prototype, at least on the breadboard that works. Uh, from there to having like a final functioning module, it takes months, sometimes years. Mm -hmm. But also because, of course, we are all not just doing one module at a time. Mm -hmm. you know? The person doing the, the circuit and software is doing multiple modules perhaps uh, at the same time I'm working on multiple projects so of course it's not like you start something and then you just work your way through and then and it's done you know yeah. because there's lots of you know times um, I would say dead times in between like for example you reach a point where you say okay now let's make a first prototype with a proper panel and knobs and everything so we can test if everything if, you know, the circuit works, if the software works, if the interface works. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from saying, okay, now let's do the prototype to actually having that prototype, that will take a bit of time, you know, because you need to draw, you know, do all the PCB routing, um, do all the drawings, send everything to somebody who then produces that. You have to assemble it. And, yeah. And, it, and so you, of course, try to fill up these dead times with other projects. So it's hard to say how much it would take if it was just like start well, me, to finish. You know? Let me ask a, a, a bit of a different question then. If you think about the amount of um, iterations that you actually need to produce to get to the point where you feel like th this is right, this is balanced, mm -hmm. um, um, this is tested enough. So yeah. like I feel yeah. like I can actually release this to the market. Yeah. Just for yeah. context, how many mm -hmm. modules have you released? Hmm, I can send you a link. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have it. I have a, yeah, I can send you later. I have a modular grid page, uh, a modular grid rack. Okay. With all the modules. Uh, you could actually uh, just share your on. screen. Feel free to just yeah, share I can your screen. Do it. I, uh, yeah, I just uh, don't have it here, but um, uh, I'm not logged in. I don't think I can find it. On, oh, so, okay. 
instead of like searching for half an hour. I'll, I, I, but can, I have I other things afterwards. where I'll share. But I think it's it's probably hmm, rough estimate or maybe way before. No, I don't have it here either. But let's say there's multiple instruments and that's at least over 20 modules. Then hex inverter should be probably 15, 16 modules. I'm just guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then there is a write devices. It's three modules. Then uh, probably it's like, I think 50 modules, something like that. Probably. Yeah. yeah. With all and this the is, minor and this is over and, how many yeah. how many years? I think I started in 2012, 13, something like right. that. So it's almost 10 years. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can see here. Let me see the first. Oh, uh, yeah, that's old stuff. But yeah, something like that. Yeah. So, so if oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just looking at yarns from Utah Williamson, that was 2013. So, yeah, 2012 is very realistic. Right. So, how. How many are we talking about when, when you have a project like, um, uh, I don't know if beads is a good example, because mm -hmm. I read also the post and I was like, <laughs> because yeah. that, that's one of the bigger ones. Let's right. say I can give you a range. Sometimes it's a matter of like doing three, four or five versions and that's it for very simple modules. Uh, sometimes it can be like 50, 60 iterations, you know, maybe with small, tiny changes, but yeah. you try out different things, uh, then maybe a prototype is made, then some things need to be readjusted, then you do more, and then you have some other ideas. You say, oh, let's try this, or let's, let's try yeah. that. Yeah. So, so let, let's talk about prototyping then, for instance. If, if you take um, a certain design, you you said you have maybe some sort of a template in Illustrator with a bunch of knobs and 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 things you could put together. Um, do you print them out? Do you mm -hmm. like how do you also how do you how do you test it? How do you I, I, internal, well, how do you test internal it, test it? Yeah, to test it. Well, one thing I do is first of all I just print the thing on paper, just on a stupid A4 piece of paper. Then let me just take the the stuff. I have some bags of knobs and, and more knobs, which I I use. And I, for things I don't have, I made myself some small like wooden. They're like like buttons, you know. When I have buttons and trimmers, which I don't have, I have these in different lengths. This is like shorter trimmers, and I just. Put them on on the paper, which you can't see right now. But like, I just put them like on the on the paper like this, and then I I take the knobs and I put one one knob for each knob I see printed out, and that's something. I do, but I do that kind of towards the end because that's you really can imagine that like this with all the knobs and buttons and everything put on the thing like that. And then it's it's mostly to see, am I touching something when I try to turn that knob? Is some it's because with these things it's very useful. They're not very stable, they don't stay in place. So mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. something moves or something falls over, you know that it's probably too close to something else. You know? Yeah. So that's a very good way to test things. Yeah. You're trying um, to sort of like compensate yeah. uh, for, for, for human error. Just moving yeah, things because, and like, yeah. yeah, if I'm touching it, then I probably should yeah. move it like a millimeter down. Because one thing that happens, uh, especially if you're like, you know, jamming around or even performing, mm -hmm. is that, first of all, because, you know, you're in the middle of something, it's not like you like carefully try to catch a knob where you're like, you know, doing lots of things maybe quickly at the same time. So one thing that happens often is that you just bump into a knob or a swoop whatever and then your like your tuning is off or your whatever goes and, and yeah and that sounds bad especially if you're in, in a performance situation but it can be just very annoying just because you don't want to do that so one thing i always try to avoid is putting things too close together so yeah people with also different hand sizes and finger diameters uh can use it comfortably without yeah doing unwanted things but that that comes towards the end because um let's say i have by now a rough idea 
how far apart things need to be spaced. Most of the time, I just look at whatever I have in Illustrator and I say, yeah, that looks a bit too close. That is. And before even getting to this phase, things are shifted around. And that's mostly to validate what we think is like right mm -hmm. and do like that. And then, of course, there's actual hardware prototypes being made, which I, fortunately, didn't have actual prototypes here because um, the early prototypes sometimes I get them sent here but they usually go back because they're used for you know other testing and 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 to also they go to early better testers but uh, I sometimes get those just to you know look at how does this interface actually feel on an actual hardware prototype and yeah like the bigger makers, they tend to go through several iterations of uh, of prototyping. So it's like you make a prototype and, and that's it. Usually there's like, I don't know, four, five, six, depends, you know, on the module. But it can be multiple iterations in the prototypes. Most of the time, because the circuit has maybe some issues, there's some stuff that doesn't work. Like it's, I mean, often, you know, things work on breadboard, great. And then you make a prototype stuff doesn't work like it used to work on the breadboard anymore mm -hmm. just because you know the small differences and capacitance and resistance that you have going from one thing to the other can sometimes mess things up yeah. i'm told i'm not really an, an electronics expert so, but that, that's what i'm told <laughs> are there um other situations you remember where um because of user testing you actually had to create um quite a drastic change in, in the design not really I mean, we did some minor tweaks, but most of the time, by the time we we reach the prototyping phase, we have gone through so many iterations that there is never really a radical change. Now, sometimes it's small things like the icons, maybe they're not super obvious, so we try to make them more obvious, or there is, I don't know, we tried, like, uh, with beats, we got a feedback that somebody said, yeah, I don't know if you have it, yeah, they are red. Yeah. <laughs> there is like, I, I always use dotted lines to show the signal flow. So you have like a, the jack connector, then you have a trim pot, that, mm -hmm. yeah, tiny inverter, and then maybe you have the, the big knob with a parameter, like, oh yeah, I have it here. So you can yeah. see there's the, the dotted line and goes up here. So you know that this jack controls time and the attenuverter will apply some modification to that signal mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't carry the line all the way here for example it's like the size jack has the dotted line only reaching the trimmer but doesn't go to the to the knob because we, we thought yeah it's obvious enough i mean once you have used the module you know that that's it. I mean, they're just one above the other. So mm -hmm. Gestalt principle of proximity is theoretically enough to, you know, uh, make that connection obvious enough. Yeah. Uh, but then somebody said, yeah, it's confusing that we don't have this line. Uh, a tester said that. We said, okay, we always, if a tester says something, we always take that and try to see if we can improve the module by, you know, following uh, through. Uh, with whatever that the issue is. Um, so we tried to add those lines, but they were just making everything more cluttered. And at the end of the day, you know, the added clutter wasn't really worth uh, the added clarity for most people. So we went back to the original design. But yeah, things like this, uh, they happen a lot and we do a lot of these small adjustments. Or yeah, sometimes it's things like uh, you make the prototype and you see, okay, things are a bit too close. So we need to move some knobs a bit up or a bit down, a bit left, a bit right. So just because they're a little bit, because maybe once when you print it out, it's okay. But then once you have the actual thing, maybe the trimmers are a bit taller or yeah, it can happen that these things need to be a bit tweaked. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. How, um, when you when you uh, build up an idea uh, for the interface, you were mentioning at the beginning that um, there is a um, it's it's like there is an overlap between the interaction, the user experience, and the brand, the visual identity, the style. Um, how do you approach this? So you, 
In most cases, there is an already defined visual world where the whole thing takes place, I would say. So maybe mm, let me just show you some examples which make this kind of more, um, let me just share the, the desktop as it is and move to, so let's, let's take again mutable instruments, which is a, a good example. And I'm just showing you this, this is the style guide. It's not the, we made several style guides, but this is like the latest one. We realigned the whole visual design in 2017. And it's just to show you, this defines the whole spectrum for mutable instruments, which of course is not only related to the modules, but to the website, to the packaging, to whatever mutable instrument does it need to have like a visual dimension. But as you can see, there's colors, there's typefaces, there is like these Indian patterns, there is a certain illustration style. Um, what's and what's, there the, is what's some... the illustration? Uh, can you go up? No, that's yeah. more for the manuals. On, on the right side, uh, at on the bo bottom right. The islands? Yeah. The islands, was an, that was an illustration for grids for the manual because we visualize the different um, written groups that grids, uh, um, how do you say, uses to produce the, the patterns, the rhythmic patterns mm. as like islands. And you navigate this, this like map of rhythmic islands going from something that's like more, I don't know, funky beat to something like 4-4 four, four, uh, March. I don't know. <laughs> They're not, not really cool. so clearly definable, but just to, to give you an idea, you know. So that was in the manual as a little illustration to make this concept more, more yeah, yeah, clear and yeah, even yeah. more, also more interesting from a visual point. Is this, yeah. is this a, a whole project of making the uh, visual identity for, for um, mutable instruments? Is this something that you, you worked on from the beginning? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was one of the first projects. Uh, actually, it started. I worked with, on it with a, a colleague of mine. I back then I used to work for an ad uh, marketing agency, and she was a colleague of my, colleague, colleague of mine. And we worked together on the initial visual identity. Uh, later, yeah, I, I, I developed that uh, further as when Paper Noise started to become Paper Noise, because mm -hmm. back then it was like. <laughs> not really yeah it, it actually was kind of born out of mutable instruments i could say yeah so yeah so that's, yeah, you can go uh, on and ju yeah. just go through yeah, it. no, it's it's really beautiful. Okay. and yeah as you can see here i i have some things that i noted down i have to say the style guide is mostly for me and emily you know it's more an internal thing so we are reminded of the, the things we decided to do you know because <laughs> With time, you 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 kind of forget about things, and and so there is some things that make up the in this case the the visual identity of mutable instruments panels and things that are never changed. So, for example, there's always the module name with the module logo. There's always this this divider that kind of uh, connects to the others. Uh, if you put the modules next to each other, there's always certain colors that are being used, uh, the turquoise, is that, is that turquoise? Turquoise. Oh, wait, how do you pronounce that Tur turquoise. Yeah. turquoise? Turquoise, yeah. 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 Uh, and magenta and, and this uh, orange yellow. Mm -hmm. And you have this, for example, these dotted lines that represent the signal flow. You have the these Indian ornaments, these very fine, faint gray ornaments that we use sometimes uh, they have different functions. They have, of course, a decorative function, but they also are used to link two parameters together or they're used, they can serve as kind of tick marks, you know, just so you remember, okay, where that thing is, that's where the sweet spot for mm -hmm. that parameter is. Yeah, so they, it's a way to help, you know, the memory also if you want to recreate a certain sound. Um, and we have some guidelines and, you know, where do we put the buttons in relation to the LED, in relation to the labels, and when do we use the icons, when do we use certain colors. And, and we also, there's a whole thing about the colors that maybe is like a topic uh, by itself, which is we went away from using uh, bicolor LEDs and now try, the latest models try to use like white LEDs and 
make things less color dependent. So people uh, with color blindness, uh, yeah, are, are have less accessible. barrier to using the module. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and yeah. And for example, the outputs always have this gray background, and there's some specific rules we set for for when is it like one solid continuous background. When is it? Um, yeah, in this case, we don't have an example. In some cases, there's like separate backgrounds because things are not, things are more separate. So it depends if it's like several outputs that are related to each other. Mm -hmm. So they do different things based on a common signal, you could say, and when they do different things. Yeah, so there's all these things. So. You need to uh, imagine when I, I start to make a new module, it's not like starting from scratch. You take all of that, that's like the, the play field uh, you're playing in, and inside that you, you try to uh, find the best solution for the interface for the module that you're working on. Yeah, it's like you define the constraints for the world before. Yeah. And yeah. now you're using these constraints with new constraints, like what the module should do, what size the module is, but you don't need to now define what the knob is going to be. You know already mm -hmm. how knobs exactly, are going to yeah. look. You can yeah. choose between four, I guess, four different sizes, right? Yeah, we have, yeah, roughly four sizes. There's like the small trimmer knobs. Mm -hmm. There's a small 12, 13 millimeter knobs, and you have a 15 millimeter, and then there's a the big knob, which has been used rarely, it's been used on on, on warps and, and on frames, like a really big one. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And you yeah. and buttons, you have the illuminated, uh, the LED buttons, which have a certain size. You have the smaller black ones. And again, that's that's roughly it. Yeah. And sometimes we we use the the slider slider switches, but mm -hmm. yeah. Most of the time, it's just push buttons because everything goes through an MCU that handles all the switching. Mm -hmm. uh, with hex inverter, it's uh, maybe a bit different and interesting. Let me see, where do I start? Um, because hex inverter kind of grew more organically. So I always like to uh, talk about mutable instrument and hex inverter because they're like two sides of of the same thing, but they're kind of distinct in, in the way they develop. While mutable instruments was more like we sit down, we plan the stuff, and we like do architecture. No, we make a big plan and then we carry out the plan. It's not entirely like that, but that was the, the more or less the idea. Mm -hmm. With hex inverter, it's more like gardening, you know? You plant a seed and then you see how it grows and then you trim it and you bind it to something because it's falling over and then you keep you know adjusting it and try to make it grow in a certain way and both approaches have their strengths and their weaknesses and both are interesting for for what they are and so for example in he with hex inverter we started uh, Stacy came to me and said oh i have this module and the uh, and the panel person doesn't do the panels anymore and i want to do a redesign and i already did the uh, the logo, I think I redesigned this logo, mm -hmm. or I think maybe that was later. Yeah, I think the logo came later. So yeah, I said, like, okay, let's. It was really like 2012, long time ago, mm -hmm. and I did this this first VC noise, which was like a DIY kit back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it was a noise module, I did some things that to me felt like they would work well in something that produces noise. So the, all these zigzag. Um, is this um these zigzag lines they were like a way to you know make it look like uh, something that makes a lot of noise yeah it, it adds to the conceptual yeah. model of it it looks like yeah, yeah something i can understand and then sort of stacy like. said i have a new module it's called um let me see where it is um it's called jupiter storm and uh, it does more noise, but different noise. And it's you know, like, it's not like easy noise, which does like that kind of thing. It's, you can do lots of different uh, flavors of noise. And uh, so, yeah, I took some things from the VC noise design and I developed them further. So you can see the zigzag line state, but since the module and says already had some ideas, this whole 
um, space theme came from from him. So he said, yeah, since it was called Jupiter Storm, it was linked to the whole space thing and orbits and whatever. So I, I drew these these quadrant like graphics that to me looked like you know something a bit spacey, and then we did Galilean moons, which was like initially thought conceived as an expander to Jupiter storm, but it's basically a, it was back then a nice uh, dual VCA uh, with a built-in envelope that worked really well with Jupiter storm, but actually was a module on its own. And then later, at one point, he started to make the Newtons, which are kind of mutated recreations of classic drum sounds analog drum sounds. So again, some things stayed like we kept the zigzag line because it's, it became kind of a distinctive element. You would see that and think, oh, that's hex inverter, you know, without having to add too much other stuff. But of course, other things, of course, changed because um, actually at the beginning, mutant high, like one of the first sketches was like this, you know, I just took this stuff from these noise, Galilean moves or whatever. Um, and put it here and, and try to make it work on. But then we said, yeah, maybe let's give them a more distinct identity. And so I said, yeah, I mean, let's take the orange because to me, the, because I think the hi-hat, I can't remember was based on the eight to eight hi-hat or the nine to nine or anyway, a Roland thing. And to me, Roland drum machines, I always think about them as being orange. I don't know. <laughs> That's for me the yeah. distinctive color on them. Yeah. So that, let's use orange. That's nice. It, and it also works well with the kind of sound. And so yeah, we went with orange and then yeah, that that was kept for until the whole range was moved to PCB to black PCB panels, then we dropped the orange. Mm -hmm. And when we did the red dragon that was um, a filter based on the polyvox, uh, we did some brainstorming. Well, actually, it wasn't called Red Dragon, I think. We just uh, came up with the name at one point. But so then his, um, Stacey came to me and said, okay, I have this new module. It's a filter. It's based on the Polyvox. It's got a, you know, a couple of tricks up its sleeves. But basically, it's uh, let's work with this whole Russian theme. And I said, yeah, hmm, you're a big fan of cyberpunk. I'm shortening it down. It was, of course, a lot longer than that. So why not imagine an alternate dimension future in which the Soviet Union hasn't uh, fallen, actually just slowly uh, turned into something else. And, and the 80s, so you have like an 80s Russian cyberpunk, because um, then I did some research and I found this amazing home computers from, from the Soviet period with like the most crazy designs. And it was super inspiring. So we, we made up this whole universe, you know, which is basically the cyberpunk we know, but uh, in, in Russia. So everything a bit different. And, and then we imagined this red dragon being like this nasty hacker called mm -hmm. red dragon who like hacks into stuff. And, you know, from there, we, with each module, we made up a new story. And we also always built up the whole uh, promotion on, on visual material that was derived from this, uh, like narrative, yeah. And since uh, we said, okay, there's something Russian, let's put some red in it instead of the orange. So some, it's like we replaced the orange with the red and then I didn't want it to make like just red. So we added this, this kind of uh, yeah, blue tint uh, to it as well. Because mm -hmm. also we needed to clarify that the uh, module morphs between 6 dB uh, slope and 24 dB. So the two colors were very useful to just because the, the LED goes, I think, uh, is blue and red. So you know uh, uh, where we are in the in the in the slope spectrum. If I'm, and it's a long time ago, so I'm not really sure about that. But yeah, roughly, I think that's where it came from. And we carry that over until, of course, mind phaser happened, which is like a story by itself. Let me just see. Mind for is it, yeah, it's, it's also a good way to show like initial where we start and then where we end. This was like the first thing I did. I just, you, know, you, you can see, I just threw everything in into Illustrator and I even took the small knobs and just transformed them up to 22 or whatever, just to see, to have the size. 
and later we try yeah try to make it smaller bigger put yeah you can see all the there's of course like hundreds of these <laughs> just, yeah. i just picked up like the most relevant ones and at the beginning i i tend to put all the jacks at the bottom i i don't like personally that's one of the things where it gets a bit into the personal dimension but generally i i have a problem with modules that put too many jacks between the knobs so i try to avoid that mm -hmm. uh but then often you need to accept compromises of course so at the beginning we had it like this but it was too big we felt like hmm, we need to make this work in 30 hp because this kind of module it just needs to fit in 30 days. there's often these things where you just have the feeling that it's too big it needs to be a bit smaller because otherwise it takes up too much space for what it does so you try to you know, notice just an example with different knobs because at that time we tried out different kinds of knobs it doesn't happen a lot but in this case uh hexinverter was in the process of, of trying out new knobs so uh yeah we, we also consider this this big mm -hmm. skirt knobs which actually the, the knob itself is just like the others but it has this very big skirt and then yeah bigger knobs yeah i think it's like the ones that um yeah. Uh, Jason is using um, mm -hmm. exactly yeah, yeah 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 and then there was a point where I said yeah it's there the, they came up with new features you know so new features were added and then I had to redesign the whole layout again because it wouldn't fit in 30 HP otherwise so and we moved like jacks and top we, we need we had to move things a bit around to make the whole thing work. Uh, and up to this point, as you can see, we're still working with the visual identity that was defined by Red Dragon and then mm -hmm. by VCNO. But then at one point, oh yeah, there's also a shift here happening where we, where they they figured out that it would be cool to have buttons to invert the polarity instead of having like the classic attenuverter that you can see here, mm -hmm. which does one positive and negative on the other side they added these buttons so you have first of all more turning action on the knob and then you can also use that as a performance gesture you know inverting mm. the the cv with a push of a button and then then the whole panel then there was an issue with the metal photo panel manufacturing so the company that up to that point made all the aluminium panels for hex inverter uh, was not reliable anymore. And so Stacy decided to explore other options. And at the end, uh, we decided to go with PC PCB material panels like the make noise, mm -hmm. uh, the black make noise modules. And so the whole thing had to be redesigned and we had also some new design opportunities so because with aluminium you have this bit annoying thing uh, that you can't really i mean the only thing you can do with leds is just to make a hole and then stick the led through the hole or put the light pipe into the hole but it's always like a circular or rectangular hole and you have an led underneath mm -hmm. with pcb there's the great thing that you can have just windows on the PCB, because the, the the material the PCB is made of is translucent. So if you just don't cover it with copper or with the solder mask, light can shine through it. And so we decided to explore that. And in the end, that's kind of where we landed. Thank God. It's not that. the end though. <laughs> <laughs> because then when we built a prototype, and yeah, of course, as you can see, the whole visual appearance, of course, changed quite radically because I tried to translate some of the elements that we had here. So like this, this great triangle uh, became, yeah, I thought, how can we do that? Because we only have white, gold, and black. So the idea I had was, what if we just leave out a bit of gold and make like a three-dimensional, like a relief effect? And that's what we actually did for the triangle and then later for the wave shaper and for the pulse modulation bus. 
to make these appear as a unit, as a, yeah, to, um, again, it's to make the interface clearer, to yeah. group things so together. Clear exactly. structure. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, we added this background, so it's it's a bit easier to understand how the thing is structured. So in the end, that's, I don't know how well you can see that here, but the the triangle is kind of visible. That's more or less the, and then we change it again. Because one thing we noticed once the first prototypes were made is that it's the LEDs, when you put them underneath, of course, they don't light up just the one window you put above the LED. They light up everything in a certain radius. And we put things a bit too closely. So we thought we could put the LEDs closer to the panel, but then we couldn't. And so we had to redesign the panel and move the windows. The trick we use is move the windows on both to the sides of the knob. So the knob itself mm -hmm. works as a barrier and when one LED is lit up, it doesn't shine on the other window. Cool. So moving things around and adding some lines, for example, from the button here to the LED window here, we managed to make it all work. And yeah, and here you can also see that at one point I also, for, for like newer modules, I make some 3D renders. Mm, yeah, I was mostly, if this is a yeah, yeah, it's a three D render. We use that a lot for promotion because, uh, yeah, the first prototypes were really like you know, taped together. So, and and of course, you can use that to uh, we made like some videos. Or this was also very useful the three D render because we could test how the windows would like look. You know when you make them blink when you shine light, when they change uh, color and, and so on. So we also did these animations just to see how the LEDs kind of feel when you have them blinking and doing their, their thing. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, then the next thing was figure out how to get those colors, but yeah, <laughs> again, because of course you say, hey, okay, let's put the purple LED underneath the panel and it doesn't look purple anymore. So yeah. How do we make it look purple? So we had to change some colors because the colors we thought they just didn't work or they didn't work as well as we thought or they weren't bright enough. And yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, I used to work at a print shop years ago and um, well, not like uh, like an offset uh, printing and uh, you would get a project where you need to print something for uh, um, like a, a, a food, like I don't know, like a package of chips. And you can't just use CMYK for it. You really need to add more colors to make things mm -hmm. look more real. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. <laughs> the, the the challenges yeah. you're facing when you when you really need to uh, to build things physically, um, mm -hmm. things on the screen are way easier. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They have their own challenges, but when it comes to to that, yeah, yeah. The, the color is actually. <laughs> I don't have them here. I forgot to look it up. But one thing we did with, uh, for example, rabid elephant, mm -hmm. which is uh, I want to make the natural gate. Uh, they don't have a lot of modules made. But um, when we were in the process of defining the color palette for for the you know the whole visual identity and of course for the modules, and uh, since they we wanted to like have exactly those colors on the panels. And there's there's no there was no real way to like have a proper color proofing profile management uh, from computer to aluminium. So what we did is just we had the company who did the panels print out lots of swatches. So we said we want these colors. So let's make all the possible variations: darker, brighter, more saturated, less saturated, a bit five degrees more towards that spectrum, five degrees to the other spectrum, have samples printed on aluminum. And then we said, okay, that's the values that get closest to what we see on the screen. And then we knew how to, to do those. Yeah. yeah, we did that with um, another thing I did with another client was to, to even get on the same page regarding the colors. 
print out some colors, send them per mail because, of course, I'm in Italy and, and he is in the United States. So it's not like I, I can invite him over to look at my screen. Yeah. And and because sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult enough to just be on the same page regarding that red is the red I see and the same red that you see. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, so that can be quite a challenge sometimes. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, I think uh, this whole process uh, now was was super valuable to look at. Um, were there more examples you wanted to, to share? Yeah, let me see. I had, um, well, that was just more, I had just a couple of uh, things for veils. Mm-hmm. That was actually, uh, Emily came to me and said, I need to have more veils made. Uh, and I said, yeah, why not try and make a bit smaller? Because my feeling was always, it's the kind of module that for me always took a bit too much space for what it does. Mm-hmm. So I said, let's try sliders. Because to me, the VCA, especially since veils also works very well as a mixer, I said, sliders would be nice because they make it work very well as a, as a it, it turned out to be much more of a challenge than I had imagined, but uh, yeah, <laughs> in the end, I'm glad we, we managed to do that. What, um, what was the challenge there? The challenge was that um, it has so many uses mm-hmm. that it's not necessarily always uh, so... Because we were a bit... Um, there was two different camps, I remember. There's that sad... To me, it's more important to have like the CV and those who said it's more important to have the, the level, you know? Because in, in the VCA, you have like the CV amount and then you have like the, the, the basic value the and volume, to yeah. make that all kind of work well, both for mixing and for classic VCA action was not so easy. And it was mostly on, on, the, on the circuit part of things. Um, well, this mostly just, it's actually a simple module, you'd say, but we went through a lot of different small variations. Let's put those on top. Let's put those on the bottom. Mm-hmm. Uh, shall we keep the jacks and a certain spacing to be consistent with another module or should we put them uh, aligned with the sliders? And we couldn't put the sliders closer because first of all, they would be too close and they mechanically wouldn't fit. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and we, of course, we also tried knobs because at one point you say, okay, let's see what happens if we mm-hmm. do the same thing with knobs. But it uh, got very weird and crazy and the sliders were just a lot. You know, you just have one column for each channel and yeah, yeah. it doesn't get any any easier than that. Yeah, it's very easy to follow. But uh, usually, well, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Now, we also try things that we already know that don't work just to know that they really don't work. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing that we do a lot of things that we already know it doesn't work, but we just want to have a confirmation that it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, um, that's that's the great thing about doing things uh, digitally, that you could just try it out. You could just make mm-hmm. another version and it takes another few minutes and then you can kind of like scrap it, you know, like, okay, I, I just want to double check. This is not mm. irrelevant. Um, mm. And I think that um, I know from my process designing anything that I am not really evaluating things while I do them. I mm. try to just make, 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 make. And then mm. a day later or a week later, I'll look at it, yeah. fresh eyes, and I'll discover things that will really inspire. Mm. Yeah. Uh, just a small question before you move on. Yeah. Uh, the, mm. um, um, do you have a rule for uh, uh, putting the... Um, the jack inputs or outputs at the top or at the bottom? It's hard to have a rule, but generally, for example, with movable instruments, we have a rule that we don't, we always put the the jacks on the bottom of the module and that outputs should be like on the the lower Mm -hmm. uh, row and we always try, okay, let's see what would happen if we put them somewhere else, but then we'll, it's, it's these things that I said earlier, yeah. you know, with bells. I think we tried, I don't have it here. Oh yeah, we yeah, have it, it yeah. And the other thing is, you can see it very well on, um, on beats, is that usually there is two rows of knobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, of, of one jacks. is, there's like one that's connected to the trimmers usually, 
And the bottom one is the outputs, the inputs, and other CVs that are not usually connected to, don't, don't go to parameter through a Dutch inverter. Though, of course, it's a rule that needs to be broken from time to time. Uh, but that's a general idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with uh, mind phaser, for example, it's another actually a good example because it, um, it has a lot of jacks and it's, it was one of the more challenging modules. Mm, so again, outputs on the bottom. I tend to put them always on the right. That seems to be like a general convention. And I like to follow that because it makes it easier to understand, to find things when they are where you kind of expect them to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that all the outputs are on the bottom. You have the individual uh, waveform outputs and, and like the main output. Then of course, there's some inputs for CVs uh, for the PM bus. And the things on top, it's because they're, yeah, it's mostly because it was getting too crowded on the bottom. bottom so we, we move those up and it would yeah, make the whole thing a bit more hands-on within the tight space as opposed to having them all on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I find it really tricky with um uh, but, with with jacks in general because um yeah, as, as you said, when you put them in different places, then it can be very cluttered when you st when you mm -hmm. want to reach out to a knob. But at the same time, um there, it seems to me at least that there is a sort of a convention for uh, controllers that like a sequencer, for instance, mm -hmm, that would mm -hmm. basically have the jacks um, yeah. at the top yeah, because you're exactly, expected yeah. to really play with it. Mm -hmm. um, and and it also, I, I find myself uh, um, uh, uh, turning around uh, um, like the, the div kid uh, mutes, for instance, mm -hmm. um it's it's re sure really it handy to to use so i just put it at the yeah. bottom of the rack mm -hmm. um and i just flip it because then i have the, the jacks like yeah it's not mm -hmm. meant to be like this but it makes sense this one is a controller module i i did some time ago and that that was exactly the reasoning behind because it it's really a controller module it it, it does more or less what the fader on the octa track does but mm -hmm. for your rack mm -hmm. and since that's really a hands-on module and something that you might want to put in a tabletop skiff then for for me the jack should be on the top on something yeah. like that yeah I know definitely. usable instruments there is some modules that actually qualify as working potentially as a controller but then they have so many other users and there we at the beginning we define a rule that you know we keep jacks on the bottom and mm -hmm. it should be the same on all modules so that the system the modules are all consistent mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah again it's it's something's very sometimes it's very tricky because it's um sometimes a module has a very clear purpose like the the uh catalyst i showed earlier but often more often than not a module has a very wide range of of possible applications so uh, Vales is a good example. It's it's a simple module. It's just a four-channel VCA, but then it's also a mixer, and uh, it could be used like as a side side chain um, processor. Mm -hmm. It can be used as a lot of different things. It it can of course be used to shape uh, CVs. It can hence work as uh, a um, um, amplitude modulation and stuff like that. You know? So it's not really, you can't say it's a, it's that or it's that. It has so many users that at one point, the best thing in that case is just to stick to an overall consistency. And and like frames, for example, is not a good example. It, frames can work very well as a controller. You just patch things and then you just use one knob to, to control some other yeah. things. But then that's not the only thing it does, and it's good and it's consistent with the rest and has the, the jacks on the bottom. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, just another thing I could show mostly because it's uh, like a smaller, more uh, DIY project that maybe can be interesting for somebody starting out. Uh, Leaf Audio makes mostly DIY workshops. And they do different projects from like small mice makers to now Eurorack modules. And at one point they decided to do like a full kit that they would all sell, but also use for their workshops. Uh, one being the NTBA, which is like a 
a small, uh, I think it was Arduino-based uh, noise maker with different modes. Cool. Um, some more noisy, some more melodically usable. And um, it was one of those projects where I did kind of the whole process in one thing. So I started from scratch. They didn't have, they just had a rough layout. Um, I was constrained by something by the PCB, which they already had, but I could move some other things around. And I, since they were called Leaf Audio, and we, we talked a bit about their whole philosophy and what they do and what they don't do, I decided to go with organic uh, plant shapes and patterns. And that was my starting point for the whole visual aspect. And that's more or less where I landed. I made, of course, lots of different uh, variations for this, but that's kind of where I landed with this, yeah, kind of organic uh, uh, decorations that to me also symbolize how the three P parameters then kind of are linked to the main knob, which is the one that changes the, the overall mode. So the, the, the three things do different things based on what mode you're in. So I wanted to show that they all kind of are uh, relative to that big control mm -hmm. top left and yeah that's more or less some things i put in there were some initial some different options for how to visualize the the main control and an explanation on the icons but yeah that's kind of a simple module i think i made probably four or five big uh, versions of that then of course it's a bit like a fractal you know every big direction has like 10 uh, sub sketches yeah. where you try to do a bit like this a bit more a bit less or try i don't know instead of dots you try some leaf shape or you try whatever yeah. and then but yeah this is also another example where this visual identity was then carried on to other panels with of course different approaches but roughly it stayed like this yeah, I find it really interesting that uh, uh, talking to you because you come your your background is in graphic design, if I remember correctly. Yes, I, I actually I have a background as in illustration, mm -hmm. and uh, but I studied a mix of communication and industrial uh, product design, actually more than industrial design. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the. The triangle yeah. in which I, I I move. So I have this more illustration related thing. I I you know classic graphic design and communication design, but also ready it was applied to product design in in my studies. So yeah. Um, yeah, the funny thing is when I studied, of course, I said I will never do product design. It doesn't interest me. And I was very <laughs> very interested in graphics. I didn't care at all. Most of the projects I did in, in university that were related to um, product design were kind of satirical and mocking the university in some way. Uh, and then I found myself uh, years later doing exactly what I had studied. So this intersection you know, between product design and graphic design. And I said, okay, there we go. <laughs> the irony of life. <laughs> That's really nice, yeah. man. I'm I'm yeah. I'm super happy we had a chance to go through this. The, uh, there were so many uh, um, interesting points in the in 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 these stories, and yeah. me also coming from graphic design and communication, uh, I really appreciate the amount of detail yeah. you put into into the work. It's very obvious that there was a designer that like pixel fix everything until it gets to the point like right. Now I can go to sleep. <laughs> I can I can really appreciate that. It's really beautiful, um, and I think that a lot of people do. I mean, uh, uh, especially with mutable instruments. Um, I think that uh, there was also a point where Emily was uh, mentioning it a while back in an interview that I um, that I will not forget. She was like, "You really need to invest in the design." You need to get someone like Hannes to work on the design because then it expands. The project becomes stronger. It becomes more, uh, it has stronger roots. Um, and it really feels like it with mutable instruments that it it, it looks like something that um, that is really consistent, that's really alive, that that is really grounded. And I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, she's working with you. So that's really, thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, and I think it's also the dialogue aspect um, is very important in my experience. Having two sides, dial having a like a, a design dialogue, I would say mm. around uh, uh, a design a product is I think very important because often it's like Emily pushes me to do certain things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I push uh, from my side to do certain things. And and it it helps the design to be better if if there's a dialogue and it's yeah. just not just one person like blindly working and because you can get into a you know a very narrow uh, yeah. view on things and 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 lose sight of the big picture sometimes. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's really the, the the biggest challenge that we're facing as as creators, especially at the beginning of the process. That you just feel like yeah, I need to work alone. Luckily, if people like when I teach students, um, it's heavily focused on like we work in small groups, and within the groups there is interaction. Everybody working on their own project, but they always need to at least once a week brainstorm together and kind of like challenge one another. And then they need to mix between the groups to get more feedback from different people. And then they're asked to bring more people from the outside world. Well, other students from other departments mm -hmm. uh, to to also evaluate from a perspective of like, I have no idea what this is. I've never seen I don't know the process at all. And then to get another perspective. And I feel like these kind of interactions, they add a lot of depth into the project where you really feel like um not only one brain was invested in it, but more brains. There is one mm -hmm. leader. But then uh, if you're receptive, and I think that it's kind of like it's a, it has to do with maturity, like you get to a point where you understand, um, I'm confident with what I do, but I also understand that I am really, really focused on, like I have so many details that I need to hold, like so many balls that I need to play around with now that I might not really see the bigger picture. And then by talking to other people, you actually uh, get that. Nice. Hey, thanks so much for your time, man. This was really, really valuable. Um, yeah, we're going to uh, to release this soon. And um, yeah, exciting. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll talk soon. Take care. Okay. Yeah.